Okay. Yeah. So welcome everyone. Thanks so much for being here. My name is Rebecca Cummings and I'm the Digital Matters Librarian. I'll be introducing our speaker for today. Before we start the workshop, I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral home of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government. And we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Now to our speaker for today. Dr. Yamna El Said is the 2020-2021 ACLS Emerging Voices Postdoctoral Fellow of Digital Humanities. She holds a PhD and MA in communications, as well as a bachelor's and master's degrees in computer science. Her work sits at the intersection of technology, culture, and power, interrogating how technologies can hinder as well as facilitate our interactions, activism, and public dialogue. Through her research, she seeks to make the voices of marginalized populations heard, as well as help create healthier environments for their expression. She is passionate about understanding online human behavior and the relationship between technology and society, with a focus on AI and machine learning. Her passion for equitable participation has recently led her to examine ways for responsible innovation and AI fairness. The topic of Dr. El Said's talk today addresses how we can use machine learning in humanities and social science research, as well as the biases that we can introduce through our data and algorithms through a case study of her design. Since we only have a short time, I do ask that you reserve your questions uh, for the end of Dr. El Said's talk, but please feel free to put any questions in the chat and we'll get to those at the end. And with that, I will turn the mic over to our speaker for today, Dr. Yamna El Said. Thank you so much, Rebecca, for the lovely introduction. Um, so I can share my screen now, I'm co-host, right? Yes, you should be able. Awesome, awesome, okay. Great. Um, so thank you everyone for um, coming to my talk. It's a pleasure to be talking with you today about um, my research and how we can use machine learning in humanities and social science research. And that's basically my experimentation with this topic. So um, I'm just, uh, I would say a novice in starting to use machine learning in uh, social science. So I'm gonna start off by giving you a little bit of um, outline about what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I'm gonna to start you off with you know, um, a brief introduction to what is machine learning, what are its different types. Um, machine learning is a computational method. And then I'm gonna turn your attention to a case study that I've uh, designed, which is basically a social science experiment in which I utilize machine learning for the sake of content analysis. Um, and then I'm going to use that case study to introduce you to some of the issues or the challenges uh, facing machine learning, such as the problem of unintended bias, um, and also the problem of accuracy versus interpretability, um, which is an ongoing debate, really. See, some people question if this should be a debate at all. Um, and then Finally, I'm gonna introduce some of the resources that I found helpful. And hopefully if we have enough time, I'll uh, go over a quick demo of some of the um, resources that I mentioned. So AI and machine learning have recently become buzzwords in practically every circle, uh, in every discipline. You will find, you know, that people are talking about machine learning, its unintended consequences, how it's changing society, how it's changing culture. Um, but it actually goes way back. I remember taking a class about AI and neural networks back um, in 2001 or 2002. Um, but at that time, we did not quite realize uh, the potential of machine learning because the processing power was not keeping up with the neural uh, knowledge at that time. So by, the, by this time, after you know, we uh, had technology that's capable of amassing very large amounts of data, computers that have um, great storage, uh, great storage, inexpensive storage, and great processing power, we started to realize the potential of machine learning, and that's why um, it's picking up, um, in, it has been picking up in the past few years. So machine learning uh, models are basically computer algorithms. 
um, and they try to find patterns in large amounts of data. And by data, we mean anything that can be digitally stored, such as images, words, reviews, or comments, um, and those you can feed into your machine learning model. Uh, you will find them used a lot uh, in many of the services that we use today, such as Netflix, which seems to know you very well, or YouTube, or the search engines, autocomplete features, uh, social media feeds, uh, some voice assistants, uh, voice recognition such, a, such as uh, Siri and Alexa. So they're used in many of the things that we already interact with in our daily lives. And I like this definition of machine learning from IBM. Um, and it basically states that machine learning models are built through the data. Um, so instead of programming every possible case like we used to do, um, you know, each and every possible scenario using if else statements, nested if statements, for loops and while loops, you would instead feed your machine learning model very large amounts of data that describe the problem or uh, your uh, problem space and hopefully covering all possible situations. And then you let your computer program discover those patterns and those features on its own from the data. And this is what we call training. So the model would be trained on the data. You can think of machine learning as sort of this mathematical process that would try to find a statistical function that can fit or explain um, relationships between large amounts of data. Um, and so once we've trained that model, we can start to you know, let it out in the wild and let it predict the output or the solution for new data. So we might train it, for example, on the features of houses and their prices, very large amounts of that. And then it would discover, you know, um, the features that make a house of a certain price, and then you would feed it those um, features without the prices It will predict those prices for those homes, uh, for example. So that what a machine learning in a very quick nutshell might be. But machine learning also comes in different um, types. And for example, they could be um, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, or reinforcement learning, depending um, on uh, how they learn or the amount of information in the data that they're trained on. Um, so that what uh, distinguishes those three types of learning. So supervised machine learning um, basically feeds on large amounts of labeled data. That is you are um, feeding your model with data that is already labeled with the right classification or the co correct solution, so to speak. Um, usually done by a human annotator. And then it will be able to predict um, the labels or the classifications of new data that is not labeled. That's supervised uh, learning. So an example for that would be taking a database of many dog and cat images that are already pre-labeled as dogs and cats, and then feeding it an image of a dog that is not labeled and it will be able to tell you that's a dog. Unsupervised learning, on the other hand, you feed it to very large amounts of data, except that it does not have this label to come with it. Uh, you're not capable of doing that, or you don't know enough about the problem to be able to tell what each one is. And so you let your machine learning model discover on its own the form or the structure of the data. And that usually happens when you don't quite have a precise research question or you're doing more exploratory research than other supervised um, approaches. Um, so in this case, um, you would let it train on large amounts of pictures of cats and dogs that are not labeled. And in, on its own, it will be able to tell that, you know, that's a dog or that's a cat through different features in both of them. And then it will be able to predict as well. So the last one is reinforcement learning. And in reinforcement learning, um, it sort of doesn't quite learn from data that you feed into it as much as it learns from its action. So it learns through feedback. Uh, that it gets from the um, environment. 
around it, uh, especially with tasks that require uh, sort of tacit knowledge, things that you can't really describe or label such as riding a bike. And so you will find it used with robots, robots, for example. You would give it an objective or a task and um, you would ask it to um, fulfill or reach that goal. And then if it takes the right steps, you would reinforce that with uh, a reward. If it takes a wrong step, you would give it a punishment. Um, at one point, we used to call that remorse for some reason, and then it would adjust itself until um, it, le it learns that particular um, task. So those are the three types of um, the most well-known types of machine learning. Now I'm going to focus on um, supervised machine learning. That's the one um, type of machine learning that I've used in my model. And in supervised machine learning, like any machine learning, it feeds on a lot of labeled data. So if you imagine like a plain coordinate system, it's trying to fit a mathematical function, like we said, to this data. And by fitting, it means inventing or finding a function. And that function would eventually be your model or your algorithm that you will use to make predictions on new data. So um, this diagram um, describes well how supervised machine learning works. You would feed your model uh, large amounts of data that are pre-labeled. So we already know that this is a, um, a, a square, this is a triangle, and then it will be able to identify the features that distinguish a hexagon from a square. Uh, it will start to notice that, you know, squares do have, you know, four right angles, for example, as opposed to um, the three angles of a triangle and then it will learn those features. Then at a later stage, you would feed it new data that doesn't have those labels and it will be able to tell right away based on what it has learned um, the, that this is a square and that this is a triangle. So that's an example of supervised machine uh, learning. So it sounds easy enough, right? I mean, you would um, give the machine learning the world and it will produce it back to you and you can just predict stuff, but it's not that easy. Um, and, it, and it's not that straightforward and it does have a lot of pitfalls um, baked into it. Uh, so the model is as good as the data that you feed it. Uh, it can be quite hard to find a data that is representative and accurately labeled um, in order for you not to get uh, inaccurate predictions, for example. Uh, so if you're training your model to predict uh, whether um, a hotel review is positive or negative, you need to train your model on a large enough data set of hotel reviews um, that, that is descriptive of this kind of space. You will not feed it news comments, for example. You will not train it on news comments. You'll be training it on this exact same problem. And your hotel reviews no, need to be representative enough, large enough that they cover all possible negative reviews and all positive, uh, all possible positive reviews, you know, the snarkly ones and the um, hidden negativity and all that should be covered in your data in order for you to have an accurate uh, model. And it's not only about the data. Uh, I mean, bi bias can be introduced in so many ways, but I'm not going to get into the question of bias now. But one ways in which you can have um, a not very good model is if you don't optimize your model well. So we need to have good data, but we also need to have uh, and build loss and uh, cost optimization functions into your model that can produce good accuracy. And by accuracy, we mean that the percentage of correct predictions um, uh, for, uh, for the test data is high enough, usually above um, something from 85 to 90. And it depends, of course, on the problem, the level of accuracy that you would want um, to have. So basically, when you take um, a larger, a big data set, you would divide it into either a training data set um, and then a test data set. The training data set is usually around 70% or something of your data, and then your test data set might be 30% or even less. And because we have this test data set, which is labeled, we can actually measure the accuracy of our model because we already have the true labels that we can compare our prediction to and we can calculate um, our accuracy. 
So um, we should go for trying to have as much accuracy as possible using um, optimization parameters. Um, and there are so many, uh, but some of them, for example, is the learning rate. Uh, you can make it fast or slow. The learning algorithms that you're using, um, uh, one of the main problems that you may um, uh, run into is overfitting, for example, that your model may learn so much the training data that it actually spits it out and it only learns that training data and it's unable to recognize other data. And so you should try to avoid that through those optimization functions that I'm talking about by trying to improve your model and not making it overly uh, complex. So how can this be useful to um, humanities and social sciences in specific? Um, usually digital humanities tries to draw insights from large corpora of texts. We do that by um, trying to first pre-process and clean huge amounts of data and try to write very complicated um, rule-based um, textual analysis of these documents. Um, but in machine learning, on the other hand, you would take a different approach. You would feed your algorithms this large amounts of data and let it figure out on its own the distinguishing features of that particular corpora of texts for the sake of either performing in classification or prediction. So you may want, for example, to um, identify or isolate stylistic or content features of authors and characters by their gender, race, um, and nationality in a collection of work. So um, a machine learning model would be uh, able to tell you that uh, that it identified this style and it identified that different style. And then you might be able to correlate that with those different um, variables. Um, it can be used for the classifications of topic, genre, or format. Um, and I've seen it also used with journalistic forms and genres, for example, how they changed over time. I've also seen uh, it used in sentiment analysis if we want to tell how the sentiment changed in a particular corpora of text over time, then this is something that we can uh, use it for as well. But now I want to turn your attention to my particular case study uh, in which I used um, machine learning to content analyze some of the comments that I received on my social science experiment um, in order to be able to answer um, a primarily social science question, which is, does humor reduce online toxicity? So my interest in humor started back uh, when I was um, studying the um, Arab Spring um, and specifically I was examining the potential of humor in overcoming political and social oppression, advancing agendas for social change, especially at times of polarization and um, state repression in authoritarian context. So those are pictures and of some of the people I interviewed or some of the memes and remixes that they created. So it was primarily primarily a qualitative uh, study. But I also wanted to test the assumptions that I was making about humor uh, quantitatively using an experiment and specifically using machine learning to analyze um, this specific question that I had. And at the time I was doing that research, I didn't quite think it applicable to the US um, because I was study studying authoritarian context. Uh, but then it was 2016 and there was, you know, an inflammatory presidential rhetoric, uh, emotions were very high, people were increasingly becoming polarized. And so I wondered about if we can, if humor can be used in any way to advance conversation because people stop talking to one another. And so I investigated this. Um, and I also want to point out before I continue that um, this is a collaboration with Professor Andrea Hollingshead from the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. Um, she um, is trained in social psychology and group interaction. So her input was very helpful in me designing this uh, particular experiment. Um, so the Particular setup of the experiment was motivated by the fact that I was um, scrolling the internet and I came across this article written by a Muslim writer. And it was written in a humorous tone. And so I have this tendency to read the comments before I finish the article. So I scrolled down 
and expecting to find the heart-wrenching comments that will uh, dehumanize the writer, connect him to terrorism and all that. But to my surprise, luckily I didn't find that. And instead I found that the comments were quite civil. Um, and I started to wonder if humor had this disarming effect on people that it might have reduced, you know, their tendency to um, be uncivil. And so I put that to the test and um, I start to examine if humor may have an effect on online toxicity. Um, I define online toxicity as anything that is rude, disrespectful or unreasonable that will make someone want to leave a conversation. It's a definition um, by uh, Borkman Dixon and Sorensen. And I find it very helpful because it captures the, um, the politeness side of incivility as well as the democratic feature that we want to have in any conversation to be inviting for everyone. And so I start with um, the research um, questions. Can humor reduce online toxicity? And if it does, how does it humor? How does humor reduce online toxicity? What might the role of anger and liking be um, in such a process? And if other people's toxicity would reduce the effect of humor on toxicity, because there has been studies that have shown that, you know, if um, a, a message is uh, communicated in an uncivil manner, then it will reduce the importance of that message or how people rate it their informational value. So likewise, I ask, I mean, if um, the uh, message is associated with uncivility from other people, would that in any way reduce uh, the effect of humor on toxicity? And so our first hypothesis that we started off with was that the use of humor will be positively associated with reduced comment toxicity. And, but I wasn't only interested in the effect of humor, direct effect of humor on toxicity. I was also interested in how that worked. What are the enablers of that relationship? And so we found uh, clues in the relief theory of humor, which postulated that the exposure to humor creates a state of counter arousal. That is, you know, you're not likely to be angered that can release tensions, increase liking and enhance source attraction which led to our second and third hypotheses that the use of humor will be positively associated with reduced anger. In other words, when someone gives you a joke, you're less likely to be angry at them. And that this reduction of anger will mediate the relationship between humor and comment toxicity. In other words, when you're less angry at someone who gave you a joke, you're less likely to be toxic towards them. And then we ask if source liking plays a role in any of that. If you liking the person who gave the joke actually helps with reducing your anger towards them and thus reducing toxicity towards them. And then we finally explored what happens if we throw incivility into the mix, because, you know, comments don't happen in a vacuum. Eventually you read other people's comments before you comment yourself. So what happens when you are exposed to other people's incivility? Would you likely to be more uncivil yourself? Would the effect of humor go away or not? Um, I also want to point out that this was, you know, a two-part experiment. So this, uh, the experiment that I'm going to show you now is just a replication of an earlier experiment, which replicated all the findings. So I'm going to just um, relate to you this experiment. So we designed a, a two by three uh, between subject experiment with two levels for humor, humor and no humor, and three levels of social influence that is exposure to other people's incivility. So um, either civil, uh, uncivil and supportive to the writer, uncivil and unsupportive to the writer. So um, we ended up with six conditions like this and people could be randomly assigned to any one of those conditions. For example, here they would read an article that is humorous and a comment underneath it is civil. Here they would read the same article that with no humor in it, we take the humor instances out and they read a toxic but supportive comment uh, on it. So a, a comment can be toxic but supportive to the um, argument of the writer or toxic but unsupportive to the argument of the writer. And we wanted to tease those, um, the difference between those two. And we recruited um, 208 participants uh, from Amazon Mechanical Turk who read an article with a comment underneath that was either civil or toxic, and they themselves wrote a public comment on the article, 
And then they responded to um, uh, a survey about the, their degree of feelings of anger and feelings of liking. Uh, this is what the gender breakdown uh, looked like. As you can see here, um, it was slightly skewed towards um, males, which is can be reflective of the um, Amazon mechanical Turk population. Uh, the political ideology was slightly, um, was somewhat balanced between conservative and uh, liberal. So we invited participants to read and comment on two articles. The first article was a distractor article. It was about technology. It was a non-humorous article, non-controversial article, just to distract the uh, participants from the kind of experiment that were conducted. And then the second article, which was our stimulus article, is this one. It's an article by uh, playwright Wajahat Ali, and he's a Muslim playwright, and he he was talking about an incident, an unfortunate incident in which um, a Muslim um, a student was taken off a flight for uh, talking on the phone and saying the word inshallah or God willing. Um, so he used this opportunity to humorously introduce the meaning, uh, the Arabic meaning of the word inshallah. So it was a very humorous article. It was a very funny article that's talking about a very serious um, incident. And then once people read uh, the article, they were asked if they can comment on the article after reading a comment underneath it. Um, they were told that their comments might be seen by other people in the future to mimic the public nature uh, of commenting in general. And their comments were anonymous because anonymity tends to be condu conducive to incivility. And this is an example of our humor manipulation. You can see here, this is the humor condition. There, there the joke is, but in the no humor condition, we just take the joke instances out, but it remains to be of the same informational value, just no humor. So here comes the machine learning part. Once we conducted the experiment, people read the articles and gave us their comments, we were left with the problem of how to code the comments, how to code the toxicity of the comments um, and how to decide on that. And in an earlier iteration, we had human raters go about deciding the toxicity of the online comments. So we had developed a very complicated criteria about what toxicity is and what toxicity isn't. Um, and we went about coding the comments by hand ourselves. And we found this to be a very subjective process a very inconsistent process because we couldn't quite agree on what toxicity is, especially when you have raiders who are from different backgrounds, especially when you're talking about toxicity directed at a minority group. And so, you know, someone may consider a stereotype as toxic, but another one from a, um, a majority might consider that, well, that's fine, that's okay. So we couldn't quite agree. And so we decided to use machine learning. Uh, as a more objective and systematic way of deciding the toxicity of the online comments. And we used a specific kind of machine learning, which is called sentiment analysis. And in sentiment analysis, what we try to do is that um, we predict the polarity of the text as either positive or negative. You find it used a lot in um, online reviews, in the analysis of tweets, uh, the toxicity of tweets in specific, um, in the analysis of print media coverage, for example. Um, it's used quite a lot. And it's also a machine learning model that needs to be fed on large amounts of data. Um, until, until it can predict new, uh, the values for new data. And it comes in two types. The first type is a classification um, model. That is, you would give it an input and it would decide whether uh, it belongs to one or more classes, or it's a regression model, in which case you give it um, the data and it would predict a value for that data. So you give it features of a house and it will predict, for example, the price, expected price of that house. Um, so for our specific case, we utilized a regression sentiment analysis model because we wanted to know the degree of toxicity in the comments, not only whether they were toxic or not toxic. Um, so um, we were lucky enough to find um, a great training data set, which is called a toxic comments data set. 
and it's provided by the civil commons platform. Um, so the civil commons platform, it has an interesting story. They went out of business um, at one point and they decided to make their data set of over 2 million comments available for researchers of incivility so they, they can continue the research on incivility. Um, and so we take that data set and we download it. And upon inspection, we found that um, it was quite unbalanced. So you had um, fewer toxic comments compared to civil comments. And that's the nature of it. There are a few toxic comments, but just one is enough. So um, we decide to undersample the civil comments so that we have an equal, equal amount of both toxic and civil comments. And we train our uh, model on this sort of balanced data set. So we ended up with around 300,000 total comments. This is what it looked like. So you can see here the comments, um, some of them civil, some of them not civil. The target here represents the degree of um, toxicity or the rating of toxicity. Um, apparently here, a bunch of losers is highly toxic. Um, and because this is textual, you could put it in an Excel sheet. Um, this is um, a, a word cloud of the toxic comments data set where um, the size of the word represents how much is how much it is represented in the data. The bigger the word, the more it is represented. Um, so you can see some of the words that were used in the toxic comments data set. And then we built our toxicity prediction model using a feed forward deep neural network. Um, it was developed using Keras and Google TensorFlow, which are um, quite high level libraries that are available in Python. Um, and um, they have great tutorials that you can refer to in order to learn how to use them. Um, it was um, very well documented. So what you would do is that you would um, first create embeddings for the toxic comments data set. So the, as you've seen here, the toxic comments data set has a lot of text, but because we're feeding it to a machine learning model or computer algorithm, you need to transform that text into numerical representations that it can deal with. So embeddings are basically um, numerical representations of the data that carry semantic relationships in their encodings. And hence, words with similar meanings, if you envision that your data is on a plane like that, words with similar meaning would be closer in that plane to one another than words that have different meanings, for example. Um, and as I said, we created a regression model that would predict the degree of toxicity. And we ran our model on a high performing uh, cluster with 48 nodes. So just, you know, to um, uh, quickly go over the findings, now that we had this column in our data set, uh, in our data sheet, with the toxicity of each and every comment, we were able to actually test our statistical relationships. So we found that the use of humor was positively associated with reduced comment toxicity, as we predicted. So as you can see here the means for um, of toxicity, the average of toxicity in people of, in the humor group were less than the average of toxicity in people uh, of uh, reading a non-humorous article. Uh, the average of anger in people who were who read a humorous article was less than the people in the non-humorous condition, and so the use of humor was positively associated with reduced anger. And this reduction of anger did mediate, fully mediate the relationship between uh, humor and comment toxicity. And we found also that source liking mediated the relationship between um, humor and anger. In other words, our, in a nutshell, what our findings showed is that when you're exposed to humor, you're less likely to be angry at the person in front of you um, you're more likely to like them, and hence you're less likely to be um, uh, toxic towards them. With regards to the incivility findings, uh, we actually did not find any significant effect of exposure to toxicity on common toxicity, which is um, surprising. Uh, you would think that exposure to incivility would make you um, uncivil, but we didn't find this effect um, in our experiment. And we, we did have some speculations as to why this happened, uh, but that's not the topic of this talk. 
So some of the implications of um, our findings um, is that we need to think about what we are trying to communicate and in what context do we understand um, those findings. So remember when we mentioned that um, the article that we're speaking about was about uh, a Muslim man being subjected to a racist incident. Um, but in no way are we um, indicating that people should use humor in the face of other racism. Um, our article was just a stimulus article to try to understand how humor works and how it might affect online um, toxicity, possibly giving guidance on how to deflect general situational incivility. Uh, but in questions of other racism um, and systemic racism, we need, we need far more systemic solutions uh, than this. So that needs to be uh, clarified. Um, the other thing it's pointing us to is the role of emotions in battling toxic behavior online. So uh, you will find that a lot of social media websites are battling daily um, toxicity uh, and they're doing their best really in trying to do that. But the, the focus is so much on the logical channels, on misinformation, uh, battling misinformation with facts. Um, and it doesn't leave a lot of space for people to think about uh, what about the role of emotions? What about the emotional channels that we might want to tap into if we are tackling a primarily emotional um, phenomenon? And finally, um, I also want to point out that the specific kind of humor that's used in the article might have produced that effect. So that um, a writer, for example, was using self-deprecating humor. Uh, I'm pretty confident that if we use another type of humor, we might get another result. But that's something, of course, to be tested with other research studies. So this leads me to um, the second part of this uh, presentation. Um, which is the problems that you would find in machine learning models. So like any machine learning model, our machine learning model uh, did have a problem with bias. And it's called the problem of unintended bias um, because of the co-occurrence of um, certain identities with toxicity a lot in the toxic comments, the model wrongfully learns to associate just the mention of um, these identities with toxicity. Um, so this creates the problem of unintended bias. So just when it sees um, the mention of any minority identity, for example, um, Muslim uh, or Asian, it would just um, uh, consider it as toxic without, even if it was mentioned in a positive context. Um, so there are ways to battle this kind of unintended bias. Uh, one way is through the data that is by showing the model enough examples of both abusive and non-abusive examples of the use of this identity. So that's one way to go about it. So using supplemental data sets and uh, that are more representative. And another way is through the algorithm itself by modifying the objective function. So generally, when people test their machine learning models, they would get a 90% accuracy and they would say, okay, uh, that's a great machine learning model. But the problem is it's performing that well on the majority of people. What about specific minorities who are not well represented enough in the data? So you also need to test the accuracy for the specific minority groups inside um, uh, your machine learning model to make sure um, that you're also accurate in identifying or classifying um, comments that are specifically related to these groups, for example. But I want to zoom out uh, a little bit and from talking about the specific problems of that machine learning model to talking in general about um, some of the things that trouble people in machine learning. So one of those things um, is the fact that machine learning is a black box. So the model may identify distinguishing features that we as humans uh, may not quite understand. It doesn't make sense to us as humans. And at the end, we can only judge the model's validity from its output. 
uh, which is fine. I mean, if we're talking about um, specific research findings that won't touch a lot of people's lives, but it gets tricky when these models are making decisions that affect people's lives, such as giving them a loan or accepting them into a job or even releasing them from prison as opposed to keeping them incarcerated. Um, so this is where we not only need accurate predictions, but where we also need clear explanations about why those decisions were made. You need to explain why you didn't give me the loan or why you kept me behind bars. Um, and, and that's why people, there is a movement towards making machine learning explainable, uh, interpretable. Um, and more importantly, we also need some degree of human autonomy or oversight that can utilize the model, but doesn't completely rely on it. So one of some of the things that people have been doing recently is to try to have some explainable uh, models. And that approach basically utilizes another model that tries to mimic or replicate the behavior of your black box. Um, and this model is usually linear. And so we can interpret it. But the drawback is that it may produce the same output as a black box, but it might have utilized uh, completely different features in coming up with this output. So it's still an approximation. Another way is the interpretable models, which are less complex machine learning models um, that may incorporate domain knowledge into your algorithm, but they may come with the expense of less accuracy as they may not cover or identify all features or cases. Um, perhaps that might be related with bias as well, but this is a long debate. Um, people have very strong opinions about um, their accuracy versus interpretability um, uh, debate. So I'll not get into the details of this, but it's enough to say that many of these issues surrounding biased data sets and the need to explain machine learning decisions have driven companies, um, as you can see, to incorporate ethical AI practices so that they can think ahead of how to curate representative data sets, accurately label them, and make sure that our algorithms have tested their models accurately on all affected groups so that the machine learning model would not bi be biased towards one group over um, the other. And that's an, I think that's a very um, useful area where AI and humanities can talk to one another, where humanities can be um, helpful in pointing out the possible areas of bias that may be lost on um, uh, some of the developers of the machine learning models. Um, so that's what I have for you today. I just wanted to point out some very helpful resources in doing that research. Um, the CHPC, the Center for High Performance Computing, has been immensely helpful. Um, as I said, I learned Python to do this project. So it offered a lot of workshops on Python. Uh, it offers workshops on using clusters. So machine learning models do consume a lot of processing power. And so if you don't want to kill your machine in the process of creating your model, you might as well use one of their clusters to train your model. I'm going to show you, I think we have time. I'm going to show you um, how I did that and also just belonging to Digital Matters Lab, the reading group itself um, is very conducive for us to uh, think about those questions in between uh, discipline. Um, so it has been also immensely helpful to me. So I might as well, I just wanted to show you some of the um, tools that I found to be very helpful, specifically um, CHPC. Oh, let me see, I can do that. Okay, so to access the cluster, um, you go to ondemand.chpc.tutor.edu. Can everyone see my, um, all right. And usually you would log in. I had to actually request that they create an account for me on the cluster. Um, and they um, graciously did that for me. Or you could request that from your PI. So once I had that, I could um, 
So that's the dashboard. You would come here and you would start an interactive session. So right now, anything that I will create or any session that I will create will be over the cluster. So I could go to Jupyter Notebook, which is um, a, a coding application that you can use online. And it, what it's telling me here is that it's gonna create a session for me on the cluster. Uh, and they have um, very cool names for their cluster, King's Peak, Notch Peak, Clone Peak. Uh, so I'm gonna choose this one. I'm gonna specify the number of cores, I just need one, number of hours I'm gonna be using it and just say launch. And it will tell me, you know, you can connect to Jupyter right now. So I have one opened right here. Um, this is, what it looked like, your file system. Um, so I can put my code here. I'm now on the cluster, just cut and paste my code here. And this is what it looks like. Um, uh, Python code, this is how, uh, this is me reading the training data and the test data. This is me dividing it and doing some cleaning to the data. This is where I split the data set to training and testing. This is where I build my model. You can see there's a lot of high level usage of um, libraries because Google uh, and TensorFlow um, do provide you with a lot of um, very helpful functions. And then once I build my model, which is composed of several layers, I just fit the model. This is me uh, training my model on the data. And then I can use it to predict. So see here, I'm giving it uh, my data, uh, which is my comments. And I'm telling it, please, based on what you've learned from the huge amounts of data, the toxic comments data set, can you predict the toxicity of my comments? Um, so that's basically, you know, um, my Python code. And then I would go and open another um, shell access. So I'm going to have shell access to the cluster. Now I have my code. It's already stored. I just want to execute that code. So I would create a shell access um, to King's Peak, for example, cluster. Now this is the time where I usually forget my password. Oh, yeah. there. So uh, all I have to do is um, navigate to where I stored my Python uh, file and run a shell script of that particular Python file. So I would have a shell script that would execute that particular Python file. I just run it. And once I did that, my model is running in the background. I can still use my laptop. Um, this is the job that I just created. It's running on the cluster. I'm gonna cancel it because I don't wanna be using uh, unnecessary resources. So nine, nine, four, one, nine, nine, four. So, I mean, just so you can have an idea of how um, easily this can be done uh, using CHPC cluster. So that's about what I have for you today. Um, these are some of the selected references. I think I went over time a little bit. Um, I'd be happy to share those selected references with you. Um, and I'm happy to receive any of your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And if you could all join me in thanking our speaker for today, whether it's with a clap emoji or actual clapping. Thank you so much, Yamna. Um, we still have about 10 minutes for questions, but just maybe while our, our speaker takes a quick breath, I do want to make an announcement. Um, the deadline for Digital Matters Fellowships is March 31st, so you still have a couple weeks to put those together. It's, it's an easy application. It's a couple pages. We're eager to hear your ideas about 
digitally inflected projects in your field. If you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me at rebecca.cummings at utah.edu. But that is coming up March 31st and we have both graduate student and faculty fellowship opportunities. Um, so I have uh, at least one question I saw in the, in the chat box, which we'll get to first, and then Max, you'll be next. Um, so we have a question here, Yamna, that says, your comment about uninten unintended bias raises another question for me. How would you or others, um, others involved in similar text-based machine learning account for irony, and I assume things like sarcasm as well, which is difficult even for humans to understand without body language and vocal intonation? That's a difficult question. I mean, I think um, the main difficulty would be annotating the data set first would be difficult even like telling if this is IRA or not people, human readers may disagree. So we, we need to have a very accurate criteria. Um, that might be an impossible goal, really, <laughs> like what is IRA? Uh, but I mean, yeah, ver having a very accurate annotation criteria um with people who are diverse enough uh in their uh, understanding as well um and once we have an accurate data set that is representative as much as possible then we might be able to create a machine learning model that utilize I i'd love to take part in that um project whenever you decide to go for it <laughs> and then max i think you had a question as well yeah uh well as predicted that was great yamna thank you Thank you so much, Max. Um, and my question was about, similarly about uh, bias. So you mentioned that you you found you discovered that your model had a bias. Yeah. So maybe it would be helpful for you to explain like how you were able to see that your model had a bias. Was that because you sort of did some yours was sort of supervised in in the sentiment analysis and explain like how that actually appears in the data, like that there were negative words that were were categorized as uh, or that negative like or words that were ethnically identifying that were categorized as negative. Kind of walk us through that. Yeah, so um, when I first downloaded the data set, it was actually advertised that it had this problem of unintended uh, bias in it. Uh, but I sort of, you know, said maybe that maybe that bias won't show in my data because we're always optimistic about our research. But <laughs> unfortunately, I did find it. I mean, and, and it happens. And thank you for that question, Max, because um, it leads me to something very important, which is that we shouldn't blindly rely on the machine learning results as accurate and perfect, and we don't look at it. I had to qualitatively examine each and every comment to make sure and see it for myself that, you know, oh yeah, <laughs> the problem of unintended bias is showing in my data. It, it, it is an actual thing. Um, so they actually, um, one of the things that they're doing uh, for the toxic comments data set is that they're providing a supplemental data set um, in which, um, you know, the uh, minority identities are mentioned in a positive light so that, you know, we can alleviate that kind of bias and help the machine learning model not wrongfully say that, you know, if um, that's a comment about, um, say, uh, a minority population, then it's by default um, toxic, for example. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? I'd be curious uh, also for you to talk a little bit more about hum the humor side of it, Yamna, because one question I had, which you answered, was that this was a particular kind of humor. You mentioned that it was uh, like self-effacing humor, and it was also, I would say, like satirical in some way too. Um, and so, but obviously we're, we're familiar that we live in an era of like infotainment where humor is part and parcel of what seems to be sort of like accelerating a kind of incivility. So um, have, have you thought at all about like the follow-ups and how you might structure or think about sussing out the differences in how humor affects some of this, the impact it has on, on civility? Yeah, uh, definitely came to mind because the particular type of humor that was used is self-deprecating humor. Um, and it's um, historically, it has been used um, with religious minorities in specific. And I was wondering if there is, you know, this, um, this interaction between your identity um, and the type of humor that you use and how it might affect how people receive it. 
uh, and who the people who are receiving it belong to. Do they belong to a minority group as well or do they belong to a majority? Maybe a majority will only accept self-deprecating humor from you, right? Um, but I was curious as to um, something like satire, for example, because it can be sometimes, um, or sarcasm in specific, it can be infuriating for some people, right? I think it was there was um, research that it may even work differently between different um, political ideologies. Some um, conservatives may be more receptive or less receptive to um, humor than Democrats. You know, it differs as to how each one of them receives humor or can learn uh, or receive information through humor. So yeah, that's that's quite an interesting question and something that I certainly want to follow up on in the future. We have another I, question. Oh, sorry, I'm not. Yeah, 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 Rebecca. I think I was going to mention that. Okay, please. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you saw the question in chat. It, is it the resources? Yes. Yes. Um, the CHPC actually had great resources. They, you know, they had those um, sort of. Uh, workshop lectures that they are hands-on that you can just take the code and try it out even in, uh, during the workshop um, there is um, I have it next to me here there is this book it's called um, hands-on machine learning uh, with scikit learn I'm curious in terms of in specific for uh, machine learning um, but Python really I mean I've learned enough to in, to be able to develop that model. I actually don't have quite um, a, a comprehensive knowledge of Python. So you learn just enough to get you started on your project. And, and I think the workshop of CHPC have been great in that. So many resources there. I don't think people use books anymore. Sorry. <laughs> Medium articles, I think. We probably have time for one more question, if anyone has a question for Yana. I just wanted to say thank you so much. That was really, really helpful. And I just appreciated your breakdown of it. And it's not really a question, but maybe a suggestion would be once we're back to some kind of um, more fluid schedule, we could have a workshop. That would be really, that would be really cool. I'd love that. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yes, thank that's you, a great Yana. idea. And we have other people that would be interested in a workshop as well, and I would definitely sign up for that too. Um, for anyone here who is a student, there is a wonderful class on campus also called Programming for Everyone that David Johnson teaches um, in Python. And uh, Anna and I audited that class and it was really accessible and useful for this kind of work. Okay, well, I think with only one minute to go, we should thank our presenter again for coming and speaking today. It was a wonderful presentation. And I appreciate everyone that came today. And we have research talks coming up on April 12th. If you want to hear what our faculty and graduate student fellows have been up to uh, this semester, and please do if you're considering applying for the fellowships for fall, the deadline for that is March 31st. Okay. Thank you, Yamna. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me and for uh, listening to my talk. Thank you. <laughs>